yes welcome everyone to geohug uh so before we kick off today's session i'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today i'm here on the beautiful lands of the gadigal of the people of the aurora nation and i'd like to pay my respects to the elders past present and future so i'm so happy to have jessica hamilton joining us today it's a tongue twister so bear with me but jessica is a beamline scientist at the australian synchrotron's x-ray absorption spectroscopy beamline the synchrotron is a particle accelerator which produces extremely powerful light that is used by a range of analytical techniques and i'm super excited to learn from her today about what the synchrotron can do for earth science so it is going to be a great session i hope you all enjoy it please use the chat and you'll have the chance to jump off mute and we'll be opening up the floor at the end and yes, thank you so much, Jess, for joining. It's amazing having you. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, I'm, I'm joining from Wurundjeri land in Melbourne. Um, so I'll start by acknowledging um, Wurundjeri elders, past and present, who've managed this place for uh, millennia, geologic time, really, um, and remain its custodians today. Um, I am an environmental geochemist um, by background, and um, as Jess mentioned, I use a range of advanced X-ray techniques to look at um, mainly weathering mine tailings and how the geochemistry changes uh, through different processes. So I do work at a very fancy high-tech instrument, um, but a lot of my research is actually um, more like bucket chemistry and going out in the field and doing um, tests out there and really applied remediation work. Um, so I really enjoy the challenge of coupling these two quite different um, things together. Um, so one of my goals today is to convince you that advanced synchrotron techniques can give really practical um, information. And although they're not really um, techniques that you'd apply to all of your material on an assay scale, for example, but they are um, really useful methods that can give you information that sometimes you can't get any other way. Um, and they can really change your understanding of um, what is going on with the chemistry of materials. Um, so as a bit of a background, I, uh, I did my PhD working on trapping CO2 in mineral form um, or mineral carbonation. And I was trying to use mine tailings as a waste product um, to do that. Um, specifically at the time, I was looking at a mine um, that was chrysotile asbestos. Um, so there's a picture of it in the bottom left. It, under a microscope, it looks like really luscious unicorn hair with sparkles. Um, it's really beautiful, but it is, um, it's deadly and a real uh, a problem for these legacy sites. Um, and the OHS was uh, made working with it very tedious, but um, this mineral is really uh, quite reactive and it traps carbon naturally as it weathers. Um, so I was trying to look at low cost and low energy input um, ways to um, accelerate that process and to not only destroy asbestos, but to make a carbonate cement um, to reduce the dust hazard at that site. I did some uh, postdoctoral work on bauxite remediation, where we were trying to combine waste products together and harness microbial activity to actually transform waste into a soil. Um, and so that also involved scaling up some bucket chemistry to some really big field trials. Um, and through all of this, I've been particularly interested in um, the chemistry of trace metals um, in these systems and um, how that can change during weathering or the treatments that we're applying in remediation or carbon sequestration. So that meant I spent a little bit of time um, visiting different synchrotrons around the world mm -hmm. um, in Australia and Taiwan. Um, and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, so when the chance came to work um, at the Australian synchrotron, um, I really jumped at that. Um, so in summary, I guess I would say my research interests are around carbon sequestration, ability and toxicity in the environment, and also trying to reframe um, mineral waste from mining as resources and finding um, ways to do something useful with them rather than just leaving them in a pile forever. And across all of these things, I'm trying to integrate synchrotron techniques because it's fun and the data is awesome. Um, so I'll show you some examples of how um, this all kind of comes together today. 
This is my team now. Um, so as Jess mentioned, I work on the X-ray absorption spectroscopy beamline, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's XAS for short. Um, and it's a technique that is pretty much only possible to do at a synchrotron right now. There are some, um, there's two companies who are producing lab-based versions of this. Um, it's still kind of a bit, bit limited in functionality still at the moment, and we don't have one in Australia. So um, it's quite a unique um, technique. And the reason is you need a tunable um, energy to irradiate the sample with. Um, but this is my job. This is where I work. Um, it's a lot of science instruments and cables and things. Um, basically, we have different groups of scientists coming in um, every few days to run new and different kinds of experiments. And my role is to set things up for them and um, try and optimise the equipment for what they're trying to achieve. And also to train um, these groups of scientists about how to actually use and operate all this equipment. Because um, at the Australian Synchrotron, we operate 24 hours a day. And so people come in a team so that they can make the best use of every hour, um, even through the night. Um, and they need to be confident about how to run all of this um, by the end of the first day. So I spent a lot of time you know, doing some training and stuff as well. Um, I also collaborate uh, on the science with some of these groups and I lead my own research as well. Um, and I use this technique, but also um, a few others around the synchrotron, which I'll talk uh, a bit more about today. Um, before I go any further, um, if you're not familiar, who is ANSTO? Um, I've been talking about the Australian synchrotron. Um, ANSTO is the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. And I represent the Australian synchrotron campus in Melbourne. Um, but we have a lot of big infrastructure across New South Wales and a lot of um, just general expertise in things like mineral processing, environmental science, material science, um, and of course, nuclear science. So we are, I guess a really big research and science infrastructure organization. Um, and the Australian Synchrotron is one of those really big infrastructure um, platforms. Um, what it is, is a particle accelerator. And if you're imagining the Large Hadron Collider, um, you're not far off, That's, it's quite similar to something like that. Um, what we do is speed up electrons to almost the speed of light, and we maintain them at that speed um, in a ring. So, that's unlike the Large Hadron Collider, which is speeding things up to smash them together. We don't do that. We speed them up to maintain them um, spinning around this ring. Um, the electron storage ring is actually um, a lot of straight sections, like a 50 cent coin. Um, if you're in Australia, that will make sense. But it has a lot of corners because um, electrons like to travel in a straight line. Um, and we use electromagnets to kind of push them around at each corner to kind of turn them eventually into a circle. And every time we use a, a magnet to push them and change their direction, they lose a little bit of energy in the form of light or radiation. Um, and that's emitted at a tangent. Um, and we set up a series of instruments along that tangent to make use of that radiation or that light. Um, so we have 10 of these um, beamline uh, setups at the moment, um, but we're in a, the process of quite a major upgrade. So we're building eight more, um, almost doubling the amount of techniques um, that we offer. And some of these techniques are things that are only possible to do at a synchrotron, um, like the XAS beamline that I'm working on. Other techniques are advanced versions of lab-based um, methods that you might be familiar with already. Um, so we have quite, uh, these are the, the currently built beamlines that we use every day. Um, I'm actually only going to touch on a few, um, or we'll be here all night. So um, these are the couple that I'm the most familiar with as well. Um, so the reason synchrotrons are um, more advanced or can offer these um, specialised techniques is that that radiation that is given off is about a, uh, a billion or a million better than the sun, and it's the full spectrum of energy as well. So it's not just, um, it's anything from terahertz to visible light, UV um, and hard X-rays. And we use X-rays a lot because they happen to be on um, the wavelength is on a size scale that is similar to atomic spacing in a lot of materials. So it just so happens that X-rays are really useful for a lot of things. Um, there's some other unique properties about this light which um, also contribute to 
uh, getting better or faster data than you would from a traditional X-ray source um, in something like a lab-based XID or something like that. So I'm gonna start um, with just explaining the technique that I work on a little bit and delving into some of the others. Um, and then I'll move on, I'll explain some case studies and how we actually use uh, these techniques. So X-ray absorption spectroscopy, um, what it does is it tells us about the oxidation state and the speciation of an element. And essentially we see chemistry from the perspective of the element that we're analyzing. So um, we're sitting in the position of that element and we can figure out you know, what its state is, but also um, sometimes we can identify the local structure around it. Um, we can tell whether it's bonded to oxygen atoms or sulfur atoms and how far away those atoms are. And we can kind of build up a picture um, of the chemistry that way. With this beamline, we can um, analyze most of the elements on the periodic table. Um, and we measure quite a wide range of samples as well, whether they're concentrated or quite dilute, uh, maybe PPM level we can do. Um, and we can often be quantitative about that as well. So we can tell you the average oxidation state and we might be able to tell you whether a particular metal is present in 40% of an oxide form and 60% sulfide form, for example, which can be really useful. It's also non-destructive because we're just irradiating with X-rays. Um, so you can still use that material uh, later. And importantly, um, this is information that you can only get from a synchrotron. Um, at the moment, there's, yeah, there's not really an available lab-based equivalent um, to do this sort of thing for speciation, sometimes some elements you can do sequential extractions, um, but they're not a necessarily direct measurement of speciation. Um, and it can be sometimes complicated when you have um, a mixture of a lot of different other elements which can interfere. Um, and sometimes the uncertainty is quite high as well. So there, um, there's a lot of cases where for speciation, um, you need a direct measurement or you need an accurate measurement. Um, and that's where we can help. We do measure bulk samples. So this is an example of just a powder that's ground up, um, pressed into a flat pellet and, and analyzed that way. Um, mainly our requirement is just that the sample should be homogeneous uh, for this um, particular beamline. But um, we can do powders and liquids, slurries, thin films, all sorts of things. Um, and we also offer a range of conditions as well. So synchrotrons are notorious for being, uh, we try and do everything. We try and, you know, if you want to heat it up, okay, we'll heat it up. You know, if you want to put it under pressure, we'll find a way to do that as well. So a lot of these techniques you kind of do under different environments. Um, this is how the data looks uh, when you get it. We're looking at um, essentially an absorption edge. So it's, um, the x-axis is energy. So we're changing the energy that we're irradiating the sample with and gradually increasing that over time. And at a certain point, we start to get a response in the sample. Um, and that depends on the chemistry. So you can see uh, the edge where it jumps up, um, that shifts depending on the oxidation state of copper. So the first one to jump up is light gray and that's copper foil, where copper is in the oxidation state of zero. Next in the uh, dotted line, we've got our copper in the oxidation state of one, that takes a little longer to jump up. And then finally, um, the copper oxide where it's copper two plus, that's the last thing to jump up. So um, that's because the more, um, what we're actually doing is we're exciting electrons and they're kind of um, being expelled from the inner atom. And the more oxidized something is, the less electrons it has to spare. So it's harder to kick the, the remaining ones out. Um, that's the, the physics in a nutshell. Um, but what you can see is that depending on the oxidation state, you get a really clear visual indicator of um, the chemistry of the copper. Um, the next technique that I'll dwell on briefly is X-ray fluorescence microspectroscopy. Um, again, really long name, XFM for short. Um, but this does mapping of elemental distribution. Um, so here on the right, you've got um, a visual map of where copper is in red, where zinc is in green, and where iron is in blue. Um, and this is quantitative as well, um, with really high sensitivity. Um, and it's very high resolution as well. So we can go down to about one micrometer resolution um, here. So it's great for if you're looking at, you know, thin sections with really tiny textures and, um, you know, reactions happening at the surfaces of grains and things like that. Um, 
The really cool um, thing about this beamline is that it can do also what we do on XAS, um, but spatially. So the oxidation state we can map um, now. So instead of getting the average over a bulk powdered site, we can actually look across a thin section or across a grain and see where you might have copper one, where you might have copper two, um, and how that relates to you know, the textures in your material. Um, this is an example of a, a grain containing tungsten. Um, and we can kind of select different parts of the grain. So maybe we'll just draw a circle around a part and want to know what the chemistry in that spot is. Or we can select different elemental associations. Um, so maybe we want to look at um, where there's a really high tungsten to iron ratio. And we can kind of extract that data and see, highlight it in green exactly where that is um, and what the chemistry is in terms of the oxidation state and speciation. So here, if we highlight different areas that grain in green, and we can see there's a difference in the chemistry. Um, so it's a pretty powerful technique. Um, the other one I wanna to touch on briefly is the soft X-ray spectroscopy beamline. Um, this also gives us information about surface or the, the speciation of um, elements, but it's good at the lighter elements. Um, so X-rays are great for transition metals and heavy metals, um, but we can also do things like um, the chemistry of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and things with this beam line. Um, this is surface sensitive though. Um, so, you know, it's something that, you know, if you've got a scale or some kind of um, build up on, you know, a grain surface or something, this is kind of a good technique, um, but it doesn't see the, the bulk. Um, if you need to know the average over a whole material, that's where the um, XAS beamline comes in, which I talked to um, first. Um, the soft X-ray beamline, though, is, is quite automated. It's, um, they've done a lot of work um, making it high throughput. It's really easy to mount samples. You just kind of stick them with tape to a ruler, and you might analyse 300 samples um, over the space of a week or so. And it's really easy to do a lot of different elements um, in one experiment on this beamline. So maybe you want to know about iron and mercury and oxygen and carbon and sulfur. You can do all of those things um, in one experiment reasonably quickly on this beamline. Um, lastly, I'll talk about powder diffraction because it's something that you're probably familiar with. Um, this is the equivalent of lab-based XRD. Um, but because it's on a synchrotron, um, it's very, very fast and also more sensitive than a lab-based instrument. Um, you can see it moving here. This is, it's got a big detector which wraps around, so you can collect the whole spectrum in, you know, as fast as a minute, maybe even faster. So the advantage of um, this technique is that um, you can either do a lot of samples at once or you could do in situ experiments and that's um, what a lot of people are using it for. So you can watch um, processes as they happen. You might heat up the sample, put it under pressure or different gases and measure changes in the mineral composition um, as that process is occurring. So let's have a look at some of the case studies. These are case studies that I've been involved with um, in the last couple of years for the most part. I think there's one that I wasn't. Um, this one here is using XAS um, in terms of monitoring contamination from legacy mines. So in this case, we were concerned about arsenic and antimony, um, which was contaminating the Maclea River in New South Wales. And while we knew that um, arsenic and antimony were there, the oxidation state and the mineral associations are what determine the mobility and the toxicity of these elements. And that was um, unknown and it's really important if we're looking at remediation or even just assessing the risks. So we measured samples taken over a 320 kilometer stretch of river and were able to determine how the chemistry of each of those elements changed along that river pathway, which minerals they were associating with or whether they were you know, sorbed or structurally incorporated. Um, we can tell those sort of things with that technique. Um, this helps us to understand how far they're traveling in the environment and also what is the risk or importantly, the bioavailability of these metals um, in the environment and what the health risk would be to communities. So it also informs how remediation strategies should be targeted. Um, and that might vary on along the stretch of the river as the chemistry changes. Um, following the, with the environment theme, um, we're also able to assess the impact of contaminants on 
native species themselves. So this beam line I didn't touch on earlier, and this is one that I wasn't directly involved with. Um, but this is uh, a study that looked at organic compounds like proteins um, in native fish and how that's affected by exposure to copper in the environment. Um, so what they were able to see was that copper could disrupt the protein structure in the eye tissue of native fish. And fish rely on their sight to kind of orientate themselves and feed and, and find things. So disruption to that ability um, to see is detrimental to their health and ultimately to their survival. And this is kind of a really important information to understand the impacts of copper at non-lethal um, concentrations and helps to inform um, guidelines and how regulations might be set and what, you know, what low level impacts might be. Um, next, this is an example of microspectroscopy, um, which we did. We were looking at um, waste rock from an iron oxide copper gold mine in Brazil. Um, and in this mine, a substantial amount of the copper ends up in the waste rock. And the interest in this was from two aspects. Uh, firstly, to understand the potential for copper mobilization and leaching from the waste, um, even though it's an overall neutral pH environment. Um, secondly, there's there is a fair amount of copper in there. So, you know, what's the potential for future reprocessing um, of the waste rock for copper? You know, we need to understand how the waste rock might change um, after prolonged weathering or, um, you know, or if accelerated weathering using bioleaching um, might release copper from the waste. Um, so this um, sample had been bioleached for a year um, by collaborators at University of Queensland. And we were able to see the progression of weathering um, and copper oxidation from the original sulfide. So we were able to see bornite um, being altered to covalite and then being oxidized and actually mobilizing into the surrounding area uh, where it precipitated out with iron oxyhydroxides. Um, and even in these bioleaching columns, they were able to maintain an overall neutral, leach, neutral leachate, um, but using this high resolution, um, mapping, we were able to see that there were clearly low, locally uh, acidic environments um, where this, you know, weathering was accelerated from the bioleaching. Um, so it's a really cool way to actually see um, chemical processes and understand them at a local scale because that's often very different to um, the overall scale um, and it changes your understanding of what's going on. Uh, lastly, I want to share this example of um, a nickel story to, um, well, to touch on XFM again. This is one of my favourite beam lines, just the maps are um, so beautiful. <laughs> um, so this is a sample of tailings from the Woods Reef Crescent Hill Mine where I did my PhD. And it's ultramafic rock, so very magnesium rich. Um, and as it weathers, that magnesium is combining with carbon dioxide and forming magnesium carbonate minerals. Um, and that's naturally sequestering carbon dioxide in mineral form. Um, of course, we're interested in accelerating that process and um, using these tailings as carbon sequestration material. Um, but magnesium is not the only valuable component of these tailings. So there's, my tailings all have a lot of goodies. Um, and in this case, nickel was quite a valuable trace metal. Um, so if we were going to process this kinds of rocks um, for carbon sequestration, it would be even better if we could get out some of the nickel too. Um, but first, we need to understand the nickel chemistry. Um, and these tailings were actually considered briefly as a nickel resource in the 80s, but there's no nickel sulfides in them and no nickel specific minerals that were identified by XID at the time. So it was assumed that nickel substitutes for magnesium in serpentine, um, which makes up about 80% of the bulk material. So it's just not practical to extract something when it's um, so diffuse like that. But the advantage of um, these spectroscopy methods over methods like XRD is that we see from the point of view of nickel only. Um, so it doesn't matter what other minerals are there, what other elements are there, um, or whether nickel is in something that's crystalline or amorphous. This technique doesn't care, it'll just tell you what the nickel is doing, um, even if it's very trace. Um, so I started with an entire thin section, did some elemental mapping to figure out where the nickel was, 
and gradually kind of zoomed in on regions of interest um, to see where nickel is. And it seemed to be often associated with iron and manganese. Um, not much of a surprise, those things can substitute into serpentine as well. Um, but when we got to the spectroscopy, um, it got really interesting. So it became clear that there were two very different nickel chemistries in this material. And by selecting each of those, uh, we could see where they are. So one of them was present at high concentration, but in very small distinct grains. Uh, and that was nickel zero. Um, you can see that in the red trace. Um, and the other group um, of nickel chemistry was kind of diffusely spread throughout the bulk. Um, and that was nickel two plus um, in the blue. Um, so the one that's present at high concentration, but only tiny grains, um, that's nickel iron alloy or aurorite. Um, and it is known in um, ultramafic rocks and is kind of emerging in a couple of places as a potential nickel prospect. There's a couple of mines kind of trying to develop that in Canada. Um, but here, yeah, it turns out there's quite a lot of aurorite in this rock. Um, and in this you know, small region of this sample, it's kind of 50-50. Um, even though there's only kind of a small few grains in there, that contains the bulk of the nickel um, in this sample. So um, yeah, that really transforms how we think about the resource potential um, of this material because alloy minerals are um, quite amenable to things like gravity or magnetic separation. Um, that's a lot easier to get out than if the nickel was spread just through the serpentine. Now the XAS beamline um, can also do really high quality spectroscopy to tease apart nickel chemistry, even when it's all present as nickel two plus. Um, there's still subtle differences in nickel two plus in silicates versus carbonates versus sulfides. Um, and actually sulfides are quite distinct from, um, from the oxides. So you can see here, um, the third trace down is a sulfide and it looks very different to the ones with a pointy peak. So we can tell very easily um, the, spe the specific speciation of nickel two plus in tailings as well. So in this example, um, we're looking at tailings as they age and we're seeing that um, the older tailing samples have a lot less um, nickel in sulfides and much more present in things like the silicates and the iron oxides, which makes sense as those sulfides weather out. Um, but what's really cool is that we can be quantitative about this. Um, so that's, this is all really important information because we're considering reprocessing these tailings, um, leaching them in different ways. Um, and I'll show you an example of that now. So. This um, is an experiment where I tried to leach these ultramafic tailings um, in pH of about one uh, sulfuric acid. I added about a pore volume worth a day for about four weeks. Um, and what we found at the end of it was that nickel and other trace metals are stripped from the leached layer at the top. Um, and that acidic water is gradually neutralized by the alkaline ultramafic minerals. Um, that causes the metals to crash out and precipitate in a discrete layer, which you can see where it's kind of warmer colours, that's higher concentration. Um, so importantly, that discrete layer migrated downwards over time with continued leaching, and it got stronger and more enriched with those metals. Meanwhile, the water that was coming out of the bottom of these columns remained alkaline um, and was really magnesium rich because magnesium is much more soluble than um, all of these transition metals. So that leachate was perfect for reaction with CO2 to trap carbon dioxide. Um, and when we're done, we can kind of strip this metal rich layer out, collect it and reprocess it to re yeah, potentially recover these um, metals from a much smaller volume of residue than we started with. Um, before I finish, I just wanted to touch on some of the new beamlines and capabilities that are coming soon. So. Um, we call it the Bright Program. This is where we're building eight new beamlines on top of the 10 that we already have. And these are going to deliver things like higher throughput samples, better spatial resolution, more different environments that you can put your sample under, um, and a whole lot of new possibilities. And in particular, um, I'm excited about the medium energy spectroscopy beamline. So this will do a similar thing to XAS, um, but it'll cover 
a gap in energy range between um, XAS and the current soft X-ray beam line. It's going to be um, possible to do solve for speciation. Um, at the moment, we often go to Taiwan to do that sort of thing, um, but we'll be able to do that here in Australia pretty soon. This beam line is also going to have some really cool um, extra kit. And I want to talk a little bit about those. So firstly, it's going to have high resolution um, spectroscopy, which I'll come back to in a minute. I've got a uh, slide on that, but we'll also be able to do this elemental mapping for things, um, including sulfur, which is really exciting. Um, this crystal spectrometer, which was on the left on the, the previous slide, um, I've talked about the power of speciation and working on oxidation states and all these things, but we can do it even better with a crystal spectrometer. Um, this is an example where we used it to analyze two polymorphs of mercury sulfide. These are chemically identical compounds, but they're structurally a bit different. Um, and the blue data shows you our regular speciation analysis. There's some really subtle differences, but it is, you know, it's kind of hard to tell them apart um, with a lot of confidence. But with this new instrument, um, it really enhances the differences that we see between these really similar um, chemical um, compounds. And it, this is essentially going to really improve the way we do quantitative analysis. Um, and it's going to be great for elements like mercury, like lead, um, which, you know, sometimes their chemical forms can be um, can look fairly similar. So this element's pretty exciting. Um, it's also going to help us to do low concentration elements better. Um, I'm also excited about this instrument because I'm interested in cobalt in geologic material. It always has iron in it. And that's a real problem um, for this technique. I said before, we just focus on the element of interest, but there are exceptions where it can be a little bit difficult to do. And this is the reason why. So we get um, fluorescence x-rays emitted from the cobalt and that's how we identify it and, and analyze it. Um, but it happens to overlap with the signal we get from iron um, and nickel to some extent. And the problem is that iron is always present at an order of magnitude or more abundance than cobalt is. So it just really swamps the signal. All we see is iron and it's really difficult to tease apart what's happening with the cobalt. Um, what this instrument will do um, is filter out specifically the cobalt signal so that we don't see the iron and we don't see the nickel. Um, it's essentially a big filter. There are a handful of synchrotrons around the world that can do this, um, but we've just got this instrument for the first time at the Australian Synchrotron um, and we've been testing it out um, very recently. Last week, in fact, um, was the first time that we kind of used this. So, um, I put on some samples for the very first time. Um, now, disclaimer, we have a lot of work to do to improve the way that we do this. Um, this is just a very sneaky peek at the first test. Um, and you're actually the first people to see this data. Um, it's fresh off the press. Um, this is a sample of gerthite. So it's a iron oxide. And this one contains about 0.5 more percent cobalt. And we diluted it with cellulose a bit. So it's actually closer to about 1,000 ppm cobalt. Um, which is not off the mark to where, you know, a lot of geologic materials are. Um, and what I'm showing here is in the red, this is what we get when we try and analyze cobalt normally. We can see an edge, but um, it's really difficult to um, get much out of it because it's very noisy and it's also difficult to normalize, um, which makes it very uncertain when we're trying to compare to reference materials and figure out how much of this and how much of this we have. Um, with this new instrument, uh, we're able to really, this is um, the one that's shown in the blue, it's much less noisy. Um, it's got a very flat background, um, making it easy to normalize and compare to reference standards. And so we were able to confidently see that cobalt was present as cobalt two plus. And we could even see a little pre-edged peak feature, which can be very diagnostic. Um, so this is um, really important for figuring out what's, what's in a sample. Now, this is no, by no means an optimized test um, at all. And for example, on our instrument, we have up to five of these crystals or filters, um, and we only had one at the moment. And we 
we're also collecting this in a very um, suboptimal environment with air instead of we usually run things in helium to reduce um, air scatter and improve data quality. So, um, but this is what we get even, um, you know, it's a big improvement under uh, very suboptimal conditions and it's a great starting point. Um, we're still kind of commissioning this capability. And if there's enough interest from the community in doing uh, these kinds of measurements, um, hopefully we'll be able to purchase more of those crystals and get some really high quality data from this um, in future. So at least we proved it worked. That's step one. Um, now we're just gonna work on doing it better. So I'll just summarize with some practical notes, I guess. Why, why should you use a synchrotron? Um, the light is, is so much brighter than a lab source. Um, it means we can do a really tiny samples. For, um, this is what you might pack into a um, lab-based XRD. When we do it in synchrotron, you just need a, not even a milligram, just a, a speck of dust in a tiny capillary and we can work with that. Um, we also do it a lot faster and a lot better. So um, again, using this XID as a comparison, um, what might take you 10 hours in a lab, we can do much better um, in four minutes at a synchrotron. So that might translate to running many, many more samples, or it means you can do in situ studies. For example, you couldn't simulate mineral processing conditions and watch the mineralogy change as it happens. And, you know, there are other examples where um, the technique is just not possible anywhere else. And the spectroscopy methods, which I've focused a lot on, um, are an example of that. So um, when people come to us and they, they want to do their experiments, there's two main access modes that people use. Um, there's the merit-based process, which is a competitive grant process, where you submit an idea, it gets peer reviewed and scored, and then the highest ranked proposals get awarded the bean time um, based on scientific merit. Um, it is a competitive process. So if you've got an idea, definitely talk to us and we can kind of guide you through that process. Um, and then the other main way that people come to us is through the commercial um, process. So this is what you would use if you want um, guaranteed time. Um, you can get what you need to complete your project. Um, and it's also confidential. So you would keep all the IP in that case. Um, we can do you know, as little or as much as you need in terms of supporting the experiment, um, whether that's running the experiment, data analysis, preparing reports and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I hope that give you a summary of the things that a synchrotron can do. Um, but yeah, mostly thank you all for tuning in today and spending your afternoon listening to me talk. Um, I'll yeah, be very happy to answer any questions you might have.